Right, let's get going. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for coming to the Childhood Trust's No Child Left Behind webinar. I'm Lawrence Guinness, the Chief Executive of the Childhood Trust, and we are London's child poverty charity. And in the last 12 months, our campaigns have raised nearly £7 million to fund the delivery of 179 projects, providing vital, practical, and emotional support to over 250,000 disadvantaged children throughout London. We've got a great lineup of expert speakers who are going to be discussing from multiple perspectives the disproportionate impact uh, that this pandemic and lockdowns have had on disadvantaged children. To help us, I'd like to introduce very shortly the brilliant David Cohen, the award-winning investigative and campaigning journalist who has reported extensively on the impact of poverty on children and young people and has witnessed firsthand the damage that poverty inflicts. But before I hand over to David and to give you some context, uh, I'd like us to hear from two children trapped in poverty in South London, who have very courageously described their experiences over the last 12 months in support of our forthcoming Champions for Children campaign that launches on June the 8th. So I'm gonna share uh, some video with, with you all and then David will be taking over. My name is Dmunfo, I'm 10 years old and when I grow up, I want to be a movie actor. My name is Boatama, I'm, I'm 7 years old and when I grow up, I want to be a fashion designer. I cannot go outside, I always feel bored and when I sit down, um, I just feel bored and do nothing. I just eat and sleep, that's all I learn. It makes me feel hungry, yeah, and because 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 of the pandemic, yeah, um, people are losing their jobs, so there's not that much money to eat and buy clothes. When my mom is um is going outside to shop, I'm scared that she might catch coronavirus, and my dad too. Well, I'm worried because my family doesn't have enough money to survive. Uh, to buy clothes and to buy clothes and food. I'm living at Mitcham Garden Village, and this place is too small for the fact that I cannot, I cannot, I cannot. Uh, run around and play with my friends because when, when, when I invite my friends here yeah, um, uh, it's embarrassing because this place is too small, too narrow. Um, sometimes um, some kids are rough, some kids sometimes they push me and some kids bully me. I think about living in this place making it to be worse. And also, when I sleep, I don't feel comfortable. I have nightmares. Of what I'm frightened about outside is the big trucks, and and there are some people, yeah, um, dropping wines on the floor. I see strange people. That makes me feel scared. We don't en have enough space to play. Um, my um, my my mom, when she's cook, when she cooks. The, the smoke is coming into her nose even much more than us. Police are coming here all the time because of the drug dealers. I want to live in a better place that's like um, no guns and no um, small bedrooms, no um, alcohol and the other stuff. Um, I have nightmares. Uh, uh, I have nightmares when I sleep. Yeah, because when people are shouting, yeah, um, it may it makes me have um, the fry, fry, uh, the freaks, the heebie-jeebies, because it makes me scared, very very scared, and it and it makes me have dreams like um, someone coming close to me holding something in his hands. I don't feel sleepy, so I just stay up at night and. 
Oh yeah, I, I just do nothing at night. Just stay up because I don't feel sleepy at all. All you children, this is my message to you. You are not the only one feeling unsafe. Ourselves, we are feeling unsafe as well. Other kids like me, I feel sad for them and I want to share money with them. Right, that was two incredible kids living in South London who shared their experiences with us and really gave us an insight what it's been like living in those kinds of circumstances over the last 12 months. Without further ado, I'm going to hand us over to David Cohen, who's going to uh, say a few words and introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Um, a really powerful uh, film there such brave words and it really breaks your heart to hear children of that age talking about wishing there weren't guns, wishing there weren't drugs, the kind of nightmares and anxiety that they are feeling at this time, but particularly heightened because of worries with the pandemic. Um, and I think that leads really strongly into this webinar, which um, brings together some really great speakers and practitioners who we will hear from shortly. We've got six speakers um, and, and um, in about 30 minutes or so, we'll take questions from, from all of you. Um, some of the key themes we will be exploring involve the, the impact of the pandemic um, on disadvantaged children with respect to their mental health, with respect to things like the attainment gap, uh, social development, their socialization, their um, the, the limitations on play and the consequent um, impact on imagination and early years development. Um, I, um, as, as Lawrence indicated, I've, I'm, I work on both Evening Standard and The Independent. Earlier this year, I launched a campaign looking or trying to tackle uh, uh, child mental health um, some of the statistics that we, we unearthed were really shocking. Um, this was in January, we launched Young London SOS. And um, the one statistic that really jumped out at me was that more than 500,000 previously healthy children um, had been pushed over the edge by the pandemic and would need mental health support for the first time. That was according to the Center for Mental Health. Uh, the situation since then, it's a fast changing and deteriorating picture. And sadly, it's probably worsened since then. Um, but um, that, that was something that brought me up short. Also, the statistics of child poverty in London are, are really extraordinary. I mean, 38% of children uh, live in poverty. In some boroughs, in the worst borough, Tower Hamlets, it's 56%. In the next worst, Newham, it's 50%. Um, food poverty is another big area that I've been involved with and campaigned on, and which I think will be discussed tonight. We've got around 100,000 children experiencing food insecurity in the capital, um, and a 128% spike in food parcels given out by food banks in the last six months to families. So um, a lot, a lot to, uh, to think about um, and a lot to chew over. Without further ado, I'm going to pass us over and introduce uh, Tamsin Newlove Delgado, who's with the University of Exeter and is Senior Clinical Lecturer and Honorary Consultant in Public Health with the Children and Young People's Mental Health Research Collaboration. Uh, and Tamsin is going to talk about the impact of the pandemic on the mental health of children and what children need to recover. Over to you, Tamsin. Wonderful. Thanks very much, David, for that introduction and to Lawrence for inviting me along. I'm just going to um, attempt to share my screen and um, do this successfully. It always works slightly differently. Um, 
So it looks like we're almost there. Um, hi, center view. And then just go back to the beginning because I was obviously rehearsing this earlier. Anyway, thank you so much again for inviting me along. And um, a lot of my research this year has obviously focused on the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health of children and young people. And so that's what I'm going to focus on today is to talk a little bit about that and a bit about um, my views and reflections on some of the actions that we can take. So obviously childhood and adolescence is a really crucial time for mental health. This is when problems may first arise. And as we know, these problems can extend into adulthood and affect children's life chances, their health, their relationship, their happiness. And whilst we know that children's experiences of the pandemic and um, how that's impacted their mental well-being are likely to be very individual to them and their families, there are also a lot of common experiences in terms of the school closures, lockdowns, which as we've heard have hit disadvantaged particularly hard. And I just wanted to present some of the general population data and also talk to you a little bit about what we know about how this has affected vulnerable children. So what does the research and the data tell us? And I think here I should actually start off by saying that child mental health problems were already on the rise before COVID-19. And we know this from the previous national surveys from 1999, 2004 and 2017, is that we'd already seen a rise in what we would call emotional disorders in particular, so things like symptoms of anxiety and depression. So we weren't in a strong position. And then um, this slide shows that there was also many inequalities in mental health in terms of children um, existing already before the pandemic. So those in the most deprived household um, where there was the lowest income had much higher proportions of children who were um, suffering from a mental health problem. Um, so I'm going to focus a little bit on some of the recent research, in particular this survey, which I was involved with this year or last year, and that's the Mental Health of Children and Young People in England 2020 survey, which happened to take place um, quite by accident, actually, in some ways, because we were due to have a three-year follow-up to the 2017 survey, and this happened in summer 2020, um, just after the start of the pandemic. And just to say the survey was um, funded by the Department for Health and commissioned by NHS Digital. Uh, just a couple of words about the survey before I present some of the results is that it was designed particularly to include children and young people that are as representative as possible of the population. Um, and it used something called the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire to determine how likely a child was to have a clinically significant problem. And I have to say here that the terminology used in the surveys is that of probable mental disorder. So I know that might be not the preferred language that we would always like to use, but I'm just going to use it in this um, presentation because that's what's used in the report. So I hope that doesn't offend anybody. Um, it's also a cross-sectional survey, which means we can't say whether one thing causes another, just that they're associated. So, the headline findings, um, which many of you might have come across, they were quite widely reported. We found there was a rise um, in the prevalence or in the proportion of children with a disorder or who probably had a disorder from one in nine when we last did the survey in 2017 to one in six in 2020. That's 16 percent of children or maybe five in a class of 30. So that's really significant. The other thing we found be really vulnerable in the 17 to 22 year age group. So more than a quarter of them um, were designated as having a probable disorder. So when I talk about this, I mean things like anxiety, depression, um, things like attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, those kind of mental health problems. We also found um, that children whose um, parents were experiencing psychological distress were more likely to have a probable mental disorder. We don't can't say which causes the other, but we know that parent and child mental health are obviously interlinked. And we know that parents' uh, mental health has been really affected by the pandemic from other surveys. The parents have had a particularly hard time. One of the particularly sad things we found is that one in 10 children and young people reported always or often feeling lonely. And this was particularly high among girls who had a probable disorder. More than a third of these girls said that they often or always felt lonely. I just wanted to highlight a few things around um, inequalities here as well. So we found that those who had a probable disorder 
were more than twice as likely to live in households where they were falling into debt during the pandemic. They were also more likely to live somewhere where the household couldn't afford to buy enough food or had to use food banks. And they were also more likely to say they didn't have social support in terms of an adult anywhere that they could turn to. And thinking about positive factors, these children were also less likely to have been exposed to positive things like exercising outdoors, being able to spend time with family or eating a meal with their family. And when we think about this high level of concern and problems, it's particularly worrying that we also saw quite low levels of help seeking. So amongst those who were aged 17 to 22 and had a probable disorder, almost two fifths of them reported they hadn't sought help for a mental health concern due to the pandemic. So that worries us that there's a huge amount of pent up problems down there. And we all know how important early intervention is for children and young people with problems. Just to highlight a couple of other findings and other data uh, with you, we know that safeguarding referrals and mental health referrals decreased, particularly in the early part of the pandemic. So again, this worries us that there are children with problems not being picked up. Similarly, that those living in lower income households in some of the surveys we've seen are reporting higher levels of difficulties. So this disadvantaged group that we're talking about, children, young people with special educational needs and disabilities, um, parents and these children have been indicating increased levels of worry and concern. And there are also concerns about eating behaviours and um, increased referrals to eating disorders um, services during the pandemic in particular too. So that's another area that we are worried about. So what do children need in order to recover? And I'm just going to give you a personal perspective here from my research. Um, is that we find a lot of people can say, well, children bounce back, they're resilient. And I say, yes, to some extent, and we hope that many are able to do so. But it's particularly important, thinking about what we're talking about today, to highlight that those who are already disadvantaged are likely to have fewer resources to draw on. So that might be in terms of financial support, household support, community support, support they get from their school. Um, so they're likely to have less factors at their disposal in order to, to bounce back. Um, people have also talked about COVID-19 as not just being a syndemic, but being, sorry, that's not just being a pandemic, also being a syndemic. And that means that the impact of the pandemic interacts with the context in which children and young families um, live. So about their things like their access to green space, the security of their job, um, in fact, many of those factors that you saw in that video, you know, the context in which those children were living meant that the impact of restrictions was much harder on them. The other thing I'd like to highlight is that children and young people are moving targets in some respects. They're developing all the time and they have critical and sensitive periods where they need more support if they're going to kind of stay on track. And therefore, intervening urgently is particularly important for children and young people. Um, there are difficult times, for instance, around starting school and leaving school, where it's really important to make sure that they don't get blown off course and that they get the support they need to start off in life successfully. That said, I would obviously caution around lots of language around catching children up, particularly academically, because again, we've heard that they have concerns about on children, and we should be thinking more about well-being and recovery rather than catching up. And also thinking ahead to if we have a future pandemic, unfortunately, that may well be the case. What do we do differently and how do we prioritise children and young people and in particular disadvantaged children and young people? Just to share a couple more thoughts about recovery before I um, hand over. We also need to know more about who's affected in the medium to longer term. So we have follow ups to the national surveys which are happening this spring and summer. We also plan to do more in-depth research with those, particularly those from more disadvantaged backgrounds and those from black and minority ethnic backgrounds to find out more about their experiences. That said, there's already good evidence that we can build on to take action. So that's in terms of prevention and promotion, targeted support and improving access to services for those who really need it. In this way, we ought to be building on protective factors and addressing risk factors. And there's a lot of great work already happening. And I've seen from the schedule that a lot of the speakers who are going to be talking are, are doing fantastic work already. So we need to be addressing things across um, the child, the family, the school and the community. 
And I put up a few things here in blue that are good evidence-based things that we can be doing. Um, I won't run through all of those now, but obviously you can read that on the slide. The other thing that I wanted to highlight really was the importance of um, a societal approach to recovery when we think about children and young people's mental health. And so some of you might have come across um, the Marmot Review carried out by Michael Marmot and colleagues um, called Build Back Fairer. And here they talk about a societal approach to recovery just in the same way as we had a societal approach to the COVID response. So we need to be doing things like addressing child poverty, focusing on early year settings in more deprived areas, and also thinking about the other end, about youth services and youth training and employment, because many young people have now been starting off in life under very difficult circumstances and with fewer opportunities than they'd normally have. So they're a group of young people that really need our help and support. I think I've talked for about my 10 minutes. I don't want to encroach on other speakers' time. So I will hand over um, and I'll be very happy to take questions later on. Thank you. Uh, hi, Lawrence. I think that my video is disabled, but oh, there we go. Um, uh, yeah, th thank you, Tamson. That was um, a great way to start with uh, some base, some some hard facts as to where we are, and also what children need to recover, and looking at what is needed for their well-being, which segues quite nicely into. Uh, Alicia Boshoran, who has worked at Southwark Food Bank and is with the Central Southwark Community Hub and um, can talk to us about some of the things that children need to recover, as well as issues that she has seen around food poverty um, and the impact of the pandemic on children. O over to you, Felicia. Thank you very much, uh, David, uh, for that presentation, for that offering, and thank you very much, Lawrence, for inviting me. Um, yes, my name is Felicia Boslerin. I am the CEO of Central Southern Community Hub. Uh, we've been going since 2017, and the a number of the things that uh, Tamsin had just spoken about, yes, yeah, she's right, they are things that have been around in our community because we've been around before COVID and it, we've seen it, that this has been an issue that we've been scrappling with. Uh, those of us who've been out on the grounds knowing that food poverty, child food poverty has been increasing and the effects it has on children. However, I'm sure that um, others will speak on that. What I've been asked to talk about today is about what we did during the pandemic. Uh, as I said, our hearts has always been around the children who are the ones that get the backlash of whatever society throws. So if their, their parents are finding it difficult to find job, um, going through any issue like mental health or anything, consequences is that there is an effect on the children. So that's always been where we um, have a special focus on ensuring that we can offer supports to children or things that will alleviate the um, uh, problems for children. And so during the pandemic, uh, we quickly scaled up and started doing home deliveries and uh, pickups for children uh, from the 8th of April. And we ran this until schools went back. And we ran and this offering them activity packs and, and, and meals, two course meals on the two days we ran the other we run it for. We also ran online courses and, and works and, and dance, cooking, arts, craft, learning, creative writing, storytelling, reading, and all sorts of things to keep kids engaged. It was a really, really challenging time, particularly at that first time when um, no one seemed to know what was happening. Schools weren't sure what they were doing. They were trying their very best, but it was really difficult. I know that our services was really, really appreciated and really came in at the right time. We saw 97 children during that first uh, lockdown from 47 families. Um, until the school reopened, we carried on going across two centres. Most of the children that came to us, we were the only lifeline. They were not getting any other online activities or any other activities. We served as the only activities that they carried out. 
And that's what we did. And we carried on until schools went back. We came back again in January when we had the next lockdown. We continued again until school went back, looking after over 100 children at that particular time. For the summer, we are planning a really big come out for our families because I think it's been a difficult time for everyone. However, it's even been worse for children. And so we wanted to make our holiday provision this summer really speak for them, really touch them, and really make a difference in what they want to, a difference, and really celebrate and give them a chance to come out for those who can and want to come out. So for this summer, we're planning to run seven holiday clubs covering a, a children from zero to 16. And because we know from experience, even though the Department of Food uh, of Education says their funding is from four or five year old to 16, where a school child is, is hungry, you find that the, the, the rest of the children in the household, the younger children, are also hungry. So our sessions cover from 0 to 16. We've got to take into consideration those are the children who are not of school age. And so we ought to run this time seven holiday clubs all together, one specifically for SEND children and their families, and one uh, with all the special equipment and sensory needs and meeting the individual needs with the specialist support to that group. Uh, we also intend to run a, a special program of dance and well-being for 11 to 16 year olds. Again, some of the age group has been touched already. Um, it is a difficult time for kids of that age and we wanted to, uh, where peer pressure is an issue, we wanted a group that would actually address and be solely for them, led by them and a program put on for them. The program will include dancing, um, the dancing, drama, and, and all sorts of things that young people would feel really engaged with. Um, we are hoping um, to be able to do that, to ensure that this coming out season of, of this summer, we will be able to engage uh, the children and we'll be able to give them enough to do to be able to and want to come out. We feel they've suffered enough. We feel they've really gone through a lot. We've all gone through, but I think it's even more so for children with, uh, with, with, with many of them not able to vocalize what they're going through. I think that's my five minutes and I don't want to take anybody else's time and I'll be around for any questions later. Thank you very much. I hand over to you, David. Thank you, Felicia. Your, your passion for your work really comes through, and um, that was really great to hear from you. Um, um, although this, the message is, is very sobering. Now, the next speaker, um, George Turner, is co-founder of Carney's Community, which is a project that's been running in Wandsworth for some time. I could give you a list of what George and Carney's community do, but I, having, I have visited Carney's community um, probably about five, six years ago, maybe even longer, but um, nothing really captures this and the amazing place this is and the incredible work they do with young, sometimes gang affected young people, people really um, who've been excluded, who are, you know, dealing with substance misuse, um, violence, family breakdown, um, etc. Um, some of the work they do is is through boxing, and um, anyway, it's really really powerful. And if 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 George will have you down, it's really worth a visit. Um, George is going to talk about uh, the mental health of teens, uh, specific problems in Battersea, and. Um, and what they're going to do to support kids this summer. Over to you, George. Thank you very much, David. Um, right, good evening, everyone. I know we're, we're running a bit over time, so I'm going to try and squeeze everything in within the five minutes. But I'm going to start off talking about some of the issues that we've seen that our young people facing, specifically around their emotional and mental health. The first one is fear of coronavirus in itself. Um, I think adolescence is a tricky time um, for anyone. And when you throw in the, the pandemic and the mixed messages, if you think about the mixed messages us as adults are getting, 
and then you multiply that by 10 for the young people. And it's not just fear of the pandemic and coronavirus, it's also fear of other health related issues uh, that where people weren't able to get the treatment they were supposed to be getting due to all resources being put on the pandemic. We're aware of a number of relatives of our young people who passed away due to that. We've also actually had one of our coaches who his treatment for cancer was stopped and he passed unfortunately as well. Um, Another issue is, as you know, most services went online and we immediately found that for a large number of our young people, they didn't have the means to access online activities. So where we were providing virtual support, we had to do a hell of a lot of work to try and access, to get new mobile phones, laptops, tablets for young people to be able to even get access to that. We've spoken already about the lack of education. Uh, education for me is the biggest crime prevention factor we've got in this country and the fact that it was shut meant that we had a number of young people not being able to, to get that kind of diversion away from negative behaviour and it meant they were even more marginalised. Uh, it also has led to people having more of a phobia of going into education. So once the uh, restrictions eased up and, and schools were open again, we found a number of young people who were previously engaging relatively well had really had pretty much dropped out and, weren't, and, and were feeling a lot of anxiety when it came to trying to go back into school and mixing with other people. This then leads to even more anxiety because it leads to less education, less qualifications. We're seeing that the economy is falling apart at the moment, and this creates anxiety for young people who are worrying about what they're going to do moving forward. Uh, it also creates anxiety for parents, which means that parents are struggling to try and make ends meet. Unfortunately, therefore, not really able to commit as much time as we'd like. To, to looking after their children and bringing up their children because they've got to try and focus on how to put food on the table. Uh, talking of food, uh, it's already been mentioned by Felicia, but the, the lack of healthy food for young people, a lot of our participants, their, their only access to healthy food was either through school dinners or through coming down to our fit and fed sessions where we provide the free food. Uh, this, this lack of foods, lack of nutritious food has a massive impact. And again, the anxiety over food poverty has already been covered as having a huge impact on emotional health. We've also found that there's been a huge overexposure to abuse for a number of our young people. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are stuck at home where they're either being victims of abuse or they're witnessing abuse with other members of their family. Uh, not only are they stuck at home for longer to experience all this, but the fact that they're not able to go and access schools, access youth centres, community centres meant there was less people available to recognise those signs of abuse and be able to start putting in some safeguarding support. And that increased the adverse childhood experiences, which also have a huge impact on mental health. And there were very limited pre protective factors to those adverse childhood experiences. As I've said, no schools, no peer groups, no youth centres. So again, lots and lots of risk factors, but very, very few protective factors. A big thing for us was exercise. As David mentioned, we, we provide boxing fitness sessions and we weren't able to provide those. We were only able to provide those virtually, which was not the same. So we had a lot of young people, they were being told you can go out and exercise, but a lot of them were actually feeling attacked when they went out to exercise. They were being challenged by other members of the public. What are you doing? You should be at home. And this is just for normal, what should be normal, um, experiences that young people should go through. Uh, many of them live in flats, small flats which are cooped up with very limited space and no gardens. Uh, they need the exercise to, to stimulate their brains and that's specific, that's really difficult to do when it's, when it's being done virtually and especially when you think of those who've got um, special educational needs. So things like ADHD, um, autism, to be able to try and stimulate their brains and help them to exercise online is, is almost impossible. And we found that also other participants who suffer from disabilities were also hit hardest. Um, it's all very well saying, go for a walk in the park. But if you need specialist equipment because of your disability, you were kind of lumbered. So we, we had a number of participants who've got spinal cord injuries who were, who were essentially stuck at home with no access to, to exercise at all, especially for the first lockdown period. I've already mentioned that some young people are feeling kind of demonised and criminalised for going out and just taking a walk in the park. Um, and if we think we had we had a number of young people who, who we actually had two young people who were arrested. Sorry, this is a frustrating doorbell that I don't know how to turn off. 
Um, but we had we had a couple of young people who were actually arrested, uh, a 12 year old and a 14 year old, uh, taken into custody and kept in custody in, uh, in the cells for over 12 hours for the crime of kicking a scaffolding pole. Uh, and I mean, the fact that you have these young people out in the community being targeted by the police, it, it, it really causes concern. These are young people who had no issues with the police initially, and now they're feeling significant issues towards the police. Uh, we, we also had a, we had complaints come into ourselves where we uh, the police contact us saying we're aware that there's criminals associating in and around your building. We had to call the police and get them to come down to see that actually these supposed criminals were members of the public coming to help us prepare food care packages for young people. One of the words that came up quite a lot when we spoke to our young people was the use of the word lonely. Uh, they felt with no activities, no peer group and distracted parents that they were just left on their own or left with just social media, which in itself has a negative impact. We saw the negative impact of social media prior to the pandemic, even more so now. There was also an overexposure to other negativity. We had the George Floyd murder, the Black Lives Matter movements, and without young people having those positive role models around them to be able to, to, to listen to their, their fears and their concerns, that's led to a lot of what we've seen as depression. And this lack of access to positive role models is a, is a massive one. What we've seen is that we're often competing against gangs, we're competing against uh, drug dealers who are trying to groom young people, and we as professionals have had to stick to the pandemic conditions and restrictions. Unfortunately, the criminals out there haven't. So they've, they've been able to provide even more of a call to young people that we feel that we may have been able to save were we able to be out more in the community. So there was less access to positive role models, less, less access to positive and constructive activities and safe places for young people to come to. So what we've started doing is we've, we've increased the boxing sessions that we provide. So we've moved from five, providing five free sessions a week to providing eight free sessions a week. Uh, we've increased the amount of key work support that we're providing. We've started a scheme called the Battersea Youth Voice, which is uh, where we get disadvantaged young people to, to go out there and speak about their concerns around disproportionality around education, policing, housing and health. Uh, we've increased our fit and fed sessions where we provide free, free food. We've started a mental health support scheme uh, and we've increased our social enterprise work so that we can employ more of our young people as they're of school leaving age and we wouldn't have been able to do this without the help of champions for children uh, so huge thank you to everyone who has already provided funding for that and to those who are going to provide funding for further schemes thank you very much back over to you david thank you george uh, clearly a huge amount of work going down at carney's community now, our next speaker, Sally Bailey, has a hugely impressive CV. Uh, Sally is currently lecturer in English at Hartford College, Oxford. She also teaches on the Sarah Lawrence uh, Visiting Program at Wadham College, Oxford, and is a writer of fiction and nonfiction. And uh, Sally was, is also the first child to go to university from West Sussex County Council Care Services. Uh, where she, she went on to St Andrews University. Sally's going to talk to us about the impact of growing up in poverty and how it impacts mental health and education and, and more. Over to you, Sally. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. And thank you for um, inviting me, Lawrence, too. So I've been, I should first say that I've been working with Lawrence Guinness um, as part of the Childhood Trust charity. And my day to day work with Lawrence is that I've been going to play with children um, as a part of an extracurricular hub activity, the Glyn Hopkin Abbey Hub in Newham um, with my colleague, Anne Griffiths, who is a visual artist. And the work that we've been doing at um, the AA Zone, Ambition, Aspire, Achieve, is to try and help the young people who come to that play center to expand their horizons, quite literally to think of themselves as people who take up more room in the world. I believe that the imagination and the route into the imagination can enable us as individuals to um, to believe that we're worth more space than perhaps the world tells us we're worth um, and the children that I've been I've been engaging with in the last six to eight weeks have been told by the world that they're not worth that they're not worth much that their space is small 
Um, I'm interested particularly in the ways in which imagination can expand one's self-understanding. So what do I mean by that? I mean by that that the imagination can develop and expand one's horizons quite literally. I grew up in a um, I grew up in a house that was made probably for four people, two flats, one on top of the other. It was um, a house provided by the council um, and there were 20 people inside that house. Um, my mother and my aunt, eight children, 12 children actually, and a grandmother. So my early childhood years were spent feeling very small and feeling very cramped, um, a bit like the hungry caterpillar in that children's story. When you're a caterpillar, you curl yourself up and you, you hide yourself away. Um, and I was taught as a young child to feel ashamed for, um, for being who I was in the world, um, which is to say, um, we came from a family that could not pay the rent and did not have enough food. And the children in the video that uh, Lawrence showed to us at the beginning of this session sp spoke a lot about their sense of shame, their lack of um, their, their lack of food, but also their lack of dignity, their, their inability to invite their friends into play, their inability to imagine themselves in a space that allowed them to be who they were, if you like. Um, and so the thing that I'm most interested in, the thing that I believe most passionately in is that is this idea that the imagination can expand and create more space for those of us who were taught to believe that space is limited and that space belongs to those who have more income and more means than we might have. And I've written a book recently, No Boys Play Here, about my childhood growing up in a spatially deprived environment and there's just two lines I want to read to you which I think summarize what I feel about the imagination. Whenever you make a space your own soon enough someone will take it from you. Space is like cake, never enough and soon eaten. I'll read it again. Whenever you make a space your own Soon enough, someone will take it from you. Space is like cake, never enough, and soon eaten. So the metaphor there is of food, cake. There's never enough cake to go around in a large family, and someone will always try to grab that space from you. And I think my way of dealing with spatial deprivation was to move into the realm of the imagination, to, to build horizons and um, space that nobody else could occupy except myself. And this is exactly what I'm trying to do with young children I'm working with now. I'm trying to show them how the imagination is limitless. It's not controlled by anybody else. Um, it's, it's, it's an appetite, if you like, that nobody but they can control. It's bottomless, it's their space. And the, the young children that I've been working with, with my colleague Anne Griffiths, are hungry to develop their own space. And I wanted just to, just to share with you a couple of tiny, tiny snippets of the work that we've been doing with them. Two small boys came to our sessions, two twins in fact, they're both fostered, as I was fostered at the age of 14. Their, their capacity for building worlds out of words is really quite remarkable and we've already generated a story in which they play the heroes of this world that they've created they're big men in this world they're actually two very small boys they're big men they're heroes of this world they're in charge of this world they're strong and powerful and they have their own domain and the thing the words that i recall from the start of this project which they brought to me as they started to talk about themselves and as they started to write stories about the world that they occupied were these three words, neglected, isolated, and kindly. They had this wonderful sense of kindness. They were looking for a space that would host them, that was kind, that would somehow deal with their sense of neglect and isolation. And one of the small boys told me, 
that he has a box on top of his wardrobe where he keeps his memories. It's his memory box. And in that memory box, he records the first family that he lived with, his first foster family, his first, his first um, guardian figures, I suppose. Um, and in that memory box, he stores away his first family. And we spoke a lot about this memory box um, and what it meant to him and what his first family meant to him. And from that memory box, we began to develop the idea of space and the imaginative space inside his own mind as a way of empowering himself to build something more than he had in fact in real space. He shared the bedroom with his brother and they're just now going to start um, separating out that space. They're demarcating it, his brother's space and his space. Um, and that really, I suppose, is the beginning of um, him understanding how he might build something more for himself. He understands that there are such things as, you know, there's real time and space, and then there's something beyond real time and space, which is his imagination. And in the last few weeks, we've started to create a story built around playing cards. Um, he and his brother are playing a game together and they're on opposite sides of um, the battle that they're fighting. One is on one side and one, one is on the other. Um, but they both have the same goal, which is very interesting to me and to my colleague Anne, the, the visual artist. And this, the goal is this. They want to build a world that is kind. And they've told us that over and over again. They want to build a world that is kind. And so the game that we're constructing with them um, is one built on that world that they brought, that word that they brought to us in first session, kindly. They want a world that is kind. Um, and so we're building with them a kind space and they're creating the rules of the game. And the rules of that game are, I think, going to be drawn out and eventually we're going to turn it into an, uh, a piece of animation. But the, the rules and the heroes and the characters of that game will be, will be made by them. They will devise the rules and they will devise the world. So that's the work I'm doing at the moment. Um, and I will go back to recommence um, that session in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, so we'll see what happens after that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sally. I think we could have listened to you for an entire hour about the concept of space. Really fascinating. And this idea of building a world that is kind. Well, that's mm -hmm. something that's really pause for thought for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, our next speaker is a practitioner, Rachel Nichols from Free To Be Kids. Now, Rachel has been working with the disadvantaged young people for over 12 years in residential community and school settings. Um, Rachel, take the floor, please. Thanks, David. Um, so yes, so I'm from Free To Be Kids and um, we're a charity that's focused on children's emotional health. And we take referrals mainly from schools, from social workers and from family support organizations for children who are struggling, whether that's at home, at school or in their relationship with other people um, and, and children who don't have access to safe places to play. And, and in, in reality, uh, usually what's going on is a combination of all of those things. So the children that we work with are often exceptionally vulnerable. Um, around 96% of them have got emotional, social and behavioral issues that their referrers are particularly worried about. Around 50% are at risk of exclusion from school or have had a referral to social services in the last year. So they're really particularly vulnerable. Um, and they're often children that other people struggle to engage. So they're often struggling to uh, come into school and to work with schools and also to work with other agencies. And, and we have um, quite a, a remarkable success rate at engaging these children because of the model that we use. So our work begins always with a five day residential project. So we take children out of London into the natural environment um, to try new things and to have new experiences. And to all intents and purposes, as far as the children are concerned, they're coming away on a really exciting holiday where they have loads of time spent on them and loads of new activities for them to do. But actually what's happening underneath that is a lot of therapeutic work and a lot of work building trust and building relationships with those children almost by stealth. 
And so we spend more time alongside a child in that in that five days that they're with us than um, a social worker or a therapist would spend in a year's worth of home visits or clinic time. Um, and, and what we aim to do is to provide through a kind of carefully curated timetable of activities, opportunities for children to feel brave, to feel adventurous. Um, and um, many of the children that come to us similarly to, to what Sally was very eloquently talking about, feel like they don't have very much space in the world. They feel like they're often failing, they're very different to their peers. Uh, there's something a bit wrong with them because they've got all of these adversities happening in their lives. And whilst we can't take away the adversity, what we do by providing opportunities for them to sleep out under the stars for the first time or canoe across a lake and um, work with their friends to build a raft or bottle feed a lamb is, is we give them opportunities to see themselves in a very different capacity and to see what they're capable of and what they can do and that they're actually have got much more potential than perhaps they realized uh, before they came away with us and from there we go on to do lots more work with them and all of that work was particularly important even before covid but post covid it's more important than ever um, echoing many of the the other speakers this evening our children have reported to us many really difficult experiences over the last uh, sort of 15 months so Last July, July 2020, 12% of them had lost a close uh, family member to COVID. And, and we expect that that has sadly increased significantly over the second wave and up to the present day. Many others, um, their family situation has broken down due to the stresses and strains of COVID. Um, and some of them have been taken into care. Others have reported having um, lots of suicidal thoughts and, and self-harming. Um, in many cases, much more than previously. One child talked to us about only having left home uh, during the lockdown period um, in, in sort of five months to go to Tesco's. So their worlds have really narrowed from, from pretty dire beginnings to begin with due to COVID. And I think um, what, what children have spoken to us about is their need to, to have space and a need just to do something. So uh, many have spoken about being being stuck at home, just sitting in front of the TV and eating and sleeping and, and not really doing anything else. And, and new, new experiences and friendships are just so important when they talk to us about what they've missed out on and what they need more than ever. And I think over the last sort of 12 months, we've heard lots of people talking about how children recover from COVID and emphasizing how children have been left behind in their learning. And of course, literacy, numeracy, uh, school learning is all very, very important and, and um, we really see the, the kind of urgent need for children to access that more than ever. But what we want to emphasise is that there's a huge amount of learning that is also happening through play. Um, when children come on our projects, they talk about conquering fears. They talk about wanting to, seeing the, the, the projects as an opportunity to sort of take every minute and try every new experience that they possibly can whilst they're with us. And, and these projects, they're, it's stretching, it's stimulating. It, it is, you know, it's hard work in many ways for the children while they're with us, but it's hard work in the best possible way. And children return from those experiences with a really broadened horizon and, and sense of their own capabilities. Teachers and social workers talk about children returning with much more confidence, with a real better sense of their own potential and a, and a better ability to access help from those around them when they need it. And all of this, is really important if they're then going to return to school and be able to pick up on their learning. And um, so I think when we, when we hear people talking about building back um, fairer and better after, after the pandemic, to us, what's really at the crux of that is this sort of work that comes about through play and through nurture and through opportunities for children to kind of see the world and see their own place within it. Um, so this summer we're hoping to offer residential projects where children will be able to do just that. And it's we're one of very few organisations actually who've come out and said that we're going to do that. Um, unfortunately, the, the guidance around what's, what's possible in terms of residential children's work is still very limited and, and we're waiting for the latest government announcements and, and the announcements from the youth sector on what is and isn't possible. Um, but we've, we've come up with a kind of plan A through to about a plan G on, on what we're going to do and how we're going to make those residentials happen, whatever the, uh, whatever the limitations are. 
Um, and we're hoping to offer between 100 and 150 uh, residential places, if we possibly can, for the most vulnerable children to have that intense opportunity to get away and play and expand their horizons. And um, so we're sort of waiting to see exactly what format that will take. But we, we want to say a huge thank you to, um, to Champions for Children, to Lawrence, to the Childhood Trust, for uh, supporting our work and for funding our work, because it, that's what's going to allow us to pay for the activities, the equipment um, and the transport and, and the food that our children are going to need to really uh, have an experience this summer that's going to allow them to come back revitalised, ready to learn and ready to recover, really. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, if, anyone have, if, if anyone has any questions, please do post them in the chat. Um, we are now going to go into our final speaker, Galima Amin Klut, who is an acting head teacher, the acting head teacher at Rotherhithe Primary, um, originally from South Africa, where I also grew up. She taught in deprived areas of Cape Town for nine years. And um, so Galima is going to talk to us about the front, life on the front line in education, what children need, and, and how um, she thinks uh, things need to move. Over to you. Good evening, everybody. And um, thank you, David. Um, very good to have a countryman um, on the panel as well. Um, so I'm, my name is Halima, as David has introduced me. I'm an executive head um, across two schools in London Borough of Southwark. And I was asked today to speak about the experiences of children um, at the grassroots level, um, really. But I thought, um, and it's something that um, George had picked up earlier that I would just like to um, start off with. Um, it's well documented. And those identified as eligible for pupil premium um, funding are generally at risk of underachievement um, and even more at risk of suffering adverse childhood experiences. And childhood experience, uh, adverse childhood experiences are traumatic events in a child's life that can have lasting impact um, through his and her adolescence and adulthood. Um, and these traumatic experiences um, comes from a range of events or possible events that a child may um, go through. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, domestic violence, parental divorce, um, substance abuse, and um, even moving homes or moving cities. Now, for children living in poverty, they are at a greater risk for suffering um, these adverse childhood experiences. And that is a base, and this is um, a known fact in, especially in the schools um, that I work, that many of our children have suffered um, more than one of these adverse childhood experiences. And um, these ACEs rarely occur in isolation, um, but often co-concur. And again, it's well researched in Ander et al. in his research of 1999. So when you add the national pandemic to what I've just explained um, for our for my typical children um, in my um, two schools, it really gives a completely different um, dimension of um, their experiences. So they've already at a disadvantage. They've already struggled socially, um, emotionally, and they may not have the happy, healthy, um, early learning and early childhood experiences um, that they need to become resilient um, adolescents and, and, and adults. So when you add the experiences that the, um, our children have gone through, through the national, um, uh, th sorry, through the um, pandemic, um, you add another three dimensional impact. So the ACEs have significantly affected our children's social, emotional um, and mental health. It affected their um, social um, ability to connect with others because of social isolation and also 
isolation from the key services that helped them through those difficult um, experiences before the pandemic. And then there's an aspect of um, the learning and their learning that has been affected. And many of our, um, the esteemed speakers before had rightfully pinpointed that, yes, the learning is extremely important, but it comes almost second to a very secure um, mental health um, and emotional health uh, for, for the child. Now, over the range, um, and I think last 14 months, the schools or all schools role has increased exponentially. Um, we've always been a focal point. Um, we've always been a protective hub and the link between our families and external services, but even more so during COVID. And although we were partially open for vulnerable um, family, uh, sorry, vulnerable children, we still try to keep the connection for all our families and especially our disadvantaged families. Um, the, the schools have tried very, very hard to um, promote mental health um, and highlight the key skills that the children would need when they returned both times from um, the uh, lockdowns. Now, the schools had to manage COVID restrictions, um, staff well-being, pupil needs, pupil well-being, and manage the um, risk assessments and risk for the uh, community. We had a lot of responsibility, but the key focus, and, our, and especially my focus, remained the child at the center of all we do and all we did and all we are attempting to do moving forward. At present, the biggest concern as a head teacher, and I'm sure my other colleagues would feel exactly the same, is the um, funding situations um, for schools. We know that youth services have been cut um, in 2011, and there was further cuts in 2017 to 2019. And around 166 youth centers have been closed down because of this. The schools normally reach out to those services if they um, need to try and link families and children to those services. And because of the funding cuts, those are now less available for our pupils. London itself is um, facing a falling role. And um, within Southwark, the borough that I work in, one in every three schools have been affected by the falling role. And that means um, less funding, less budget um, coming in, less revenue coming in, and it limits what the schools can actually do to support the vulnerable families. Um, we all have to face, unfortunately, and schools, many schools in Southwark especially, but also in other parts of London, have experienced a cut in pupil premium numbers. Now, although between um, June last year and January this year, um, there was a 20% increase in the number of children that became eligible for pupil premium funding. We have seen a between 60 and 70,000 pound drop in each school in the funding streams for pupil premium due to um, decisions being made about um, the census dates um, being moved. So schools have really lost out in the funding together with children and families being moved out of the borough housing becoming too expensive, the pandemic having an, a negative effect on that, and um, the element of gentrification um, in London. With less funding, but more need within the schools, we are going to more than ever rely on charitable organizations and the kinds of work that the Childhood Trust is doing to support um, children living in poverty and um, vulnerable families. We need initiatives like this um, to enable us as schools to continue to support um, our most vulnerable families and so that they can have the access to the services um, and uh, the services that um, they desperately um, need. And while we are all awaiting and very anxiously awaiting um, the restrictions to be lifted and life coming back to normal, I would like to urge you to remember that for most of our families, the lifting of restriction only signals 
the start of a very challenging journey ahead. And that journey, if not supported um, effectively, can have lasting impact on our children and their future, our future generation. So we need your urgent support and we will need to rely heavily on um, charitable organizations. Um, and we need everybody's commitment to ensure that we look after our children and especially our most vulnerable children. Working together to reduce the impact of social in, um, inequalities um, that have now been exacerbated by the pandemic has never been so important. We have both a moral, a social, but also a societal obligation towards our children. And where we are grateful for um, Childhood Trust for taking up initiatives like this, we do need to reach further and, and um, much further and to get as many people involved so that we can reach as many families that is uh, desperately in need um, for support and um, to ensure that we can close the gap, eradicate the um, social inequalities. Thank you, Khalima. Thank you for those insightful words and for your passion. I'm going to call Lawrence back in. Um, Lawrence, I think um, there are no chat questions posted in the chat box that I can see, but maybe people want to raise their hand and ask questions. Um, if you wanted to come back in. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm very sorry we've run over slightly. There's so much to hear about. We've heard about adversity terrible adversity that children and families have endured, particularly over the last 12 months. Families that are already struggling now are, are, are devastated by this pandemic. Our own research, which we will be sharing with you very soon, uh, bears witness to the epidemic of mental health, the legacy, the toxic legacy of the lockdowns now on disadvantaged children is the, the huge rise, the doubling of incidents of mental health, uh, particularly anxiety and depression. So we've heard about adversity, we've heard about vulnerability, but we've also heard about transformation and hope. And that's driven by our charity partners, by the likes of Ch you know, Carney's community, by the likes of Free, Free to Be Kids, by Felicia's Southwark Community Hub. Um, you know, th these are all the most amazing projects by Ambition Aspire Achieve. We have 111 projects that we're funding through this year's Champions for Children that launches on June the 8th. We will be sending you links to donate. We'll be sending you content to share. Please share it as widely as you can. The disadvantaged and vulnerable children of London need our support. I hope you've enjoyed this evening. Please don't hesitate to get in touch, to write to us, to ask us questions. We're delighted to, to always, always answer questions and to share our, our information with you. So thank you all for coming. Thank you for everyone that spoke. I wish you all a great evening and look forward to connecting with you all going forward. Thank you. All the best. And thank you, David. David I didn't thank David in particular for chairing this. Thank you. Take care, everyone, and have a great evening. All the Bye. best now. Bye, Bye. everyone. Thank you.